In this episode of Quakers Today, we ask, what was the time when you rebelled and why? We have three guests today. Some may think that at least one, if not all three, are being rebellious. They can definitely feel like outliers among certain Quakers. I'm curious about how you will receive them. I am Peter Santoscano. This is Season 2, Episode 3 of Quakers Today Podcast, a project of Friends Publishing Corporation. This season of Quakers Today is sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. Timothy Tarkelly is an English teacher, a debate coach, and a lover of the outdoors. I spend as much time outside as possible. When I'm feeling really wound up, if I'm having like a couple of days where I'm just not, my brain's not clicking right, I'm feeling agitated, I'll sometimes take stock and realize, you know, I've been really busy lately. I haven't been outside in over a week. And sometimes that means I just need to go and walk and go count the birds or go fishing or whatever. He's also a Quaker. What I'm looking for in religious community is silent worship. When you get a group of people in a room who are genuinely spiritually vulnerable and spiritually supportive, amazing things can happen. I'm a spiritual guy. I grew up in a very religious family. I've communed with lots of friends who have different faith traditions than I do. I can connect with a lot of it. But for me, the most profound experiences I've had, not just like personal revelation or anything, but feeling connected to others in worship have been in unprogrammed worship. Timothy finds that time in Quaker worship is similar to the time he spends in nature. There is something powerful about silence, but I don't think that it's just silence. I think that it's anticipation in the silence. In a meeting, you're not just sitting there silently. You're sitting there collectively. You're waiting. And maybe something comes and maybe something doesn't. That's also not the point either. Regardless of if you went through an hour in silence or if you went through an hour where people had things to share, you got to the end of that hour together. In nature, it's the same way. It is silence. It is seclusion. But you're alert. You're focused. You're waiting for this interaction to happen. In a recent article for Friends Journal... Timothy writes about nature, ecology, and the impacts humans have had on the natural world. Sound stewardship is a clear expectation of God's people. The stewardship, however, isn't to be overly idealized. To take care of the earth means to participate in its cycles. While these cycles may seem ruthless and cruel, they are in fact natural realities. Especially as humans continue to grow as a species, We need to acknowledge the effect we have on the ecosystem and the role we are forced to play in it. Expansion leads to the termination or dislocation of predator species. This is one of the reasons deer populations in Midwest North America have exploded, leading to an increase in automotive accidents, crop damage, and disease transmission, among other concerns. So far, you may be thinking that you and Timothy have a lot in common, especially if you too love being in nature. Ah, but some Quakers feel strongly that what Timothy does in nature is not at all Quakerly. Timothy is a hunter. Just like anything else in Quakerism, it's hard to find two Quakers that agree on everything. And I got a lot of like, oh, you know, I could see why you hunt. That's fine. Whatever you feel like you need to do, this is, you know, who am I to say? And the other reaction I got was, absolutely not. There's no way that you could hunt and be a Quaker. I did talk to a couple people who were like, you know, I also go hunting, but I just don't tell anybody that. (laughs) Or I also eat meat. I just don't ever mention that to my Quaker friends. My initial reaction is, maybe I don't belong in this community. If something that is important to me violates really commonly held beliefs, I don't want to be that guy. But the more I thought about it, I was just like, it's not that I wanted to prove people wrong or change their minds or enlist anyone to like become a hunter. I just felt there are certain aspects of the conversation that weren't really being discussed. You know, it was, if you do this, you are this, or as a Quaker, we can't do blank. When it comes to really deeply held ideologies, 
that we can sometimes forget to think about reality. We don't live in a vacuum. It's not that this is the way things should be done, that there's bigger things at stake. In his article, Allowable Diversions, A Friend Explores the Morality of Hunting, Timothy writes about his experiences. In the article and in our conversation, he strongly defends hunting. According to wildlife biologist Chris DiPerno, who is a professor at North Carolina State's College of Natural Resources, hunters do more to help wildlife than any other group in America. As quoted in an article for CRN News, this may seem like a contradictory statement, but the truth is that wildlife conservation largely relies on the shoulders of hunters. They fund privately, publicly, and voluntarily the majority of conservation efforts. While it is a common misconception that government conservation programs are tax-funded, In reality, they're mostly funded by hunters through the purchase of stamps, licenses, and permits for hunters and anglers. I mean, and this is not exclusive to the Quaker community, but you do hear from people like, why should we hunt? You can just go to a grocery store to get meat. There are just a lot of stereotypes around, if you enjoy hunting, you must be blank. There's lots of caricatures of hunters, you know, Elmer Fudd and people who wear like trucker hats and they just want to go into the woods and drink beer and shoot their guns. The reality is that A, hunters care about the environment because we want to go hunting. Every time we went to the river, we left a bunch of beer cans and dumped our tackle boxes in the water and left the place a mess. It wouldn't be long before we didn't have a place to do that anymore. But more importantly, I don't really know anyone who goes hunting because they want to kill animals. I don't really know where that notion comes from. I honestly have been hunting and at times have felt regretful. There have been times where I have not pulled the trigger because I just didn't feel like shooting an animal that day. And there are times when after sitting in quiet, still anticipation, Timothy sees the animal and he shoots. I most recently went squirrel hunting. I'm mostly a small game hunter. I went squirrel hunting and I made a squirrel quiche. <laughs> that is a favorite of mine and it's it's a party favorite. We had a board game night and that's the food that I brought was squirrel quiche. Timothy Tarkelly's article, Allowable Diversions, A Friend Explores the Morality of Hunting, appears in the August edition of Friends Journal. You can also find it at friendsjournal.org. In the show notes, I have links to Timothy's books of poetry and other writing. I will also post his squirrel quiche recipe. Being able to question things, which I think is important as part of Quaker faith anyway, was very helpful for me to figure out that, huh, I'm not who I thought I was, and that's okay. My name is Erin Wilson. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Tualatin, Oregon, and I am a direct member of Sierra Cascades Yearly Meeting of Friends. There was a lot of tension within Northwest Yearly Meeting, which is the yearly meeting that Sierra Cascades split off of. I think there was a lot more going on, but the issue that they pinpointed it on was LGBTQ inclusion. It was through all of that that I came out to myself. I grew up in evangelical culture where a woman is assumed straight and will end up married to a man. Through all of the things going on with the split and the church that I was a part of at the time and all of the conversations happening, I realized that I was getting very defensive about the way that LGBTQ folks were being treated. It took several months for me to figure out, oh, It's because I'm not straight. (laughs) It also became clear that when I really deconstructed my concept of sexuality and who I could or couldn't marry, there was no reason that I saw for me not to marry a woman other than that I just hadn't been in a relationship with a woman and I had not been in a relationship with a man. So the possibilities were open. I've chosen the label bisexual. I'm still figuring out what exactly that means. Being able to use Quaker values to help me process that, it was important to me. I think of the testimony of equality. That was something that was important to me with the whole experience of 
the conversation happening in Northwest Yearly Meeting that led to the split and then Sierra Cascades formation. Just knowing that if we're all equal, why does one aspect of our identity matter? That was Aaron Wilson from the Quaker Speak video entitled Coming Out to Myself in Quaker Community. You will find this Quaker Speak video and the Quaker Speak channel on YouTube or just visit quakerspeak.com. William Shedder reviewed the book Quaker Shaped Christianity How the Jesus Story and the Quaker Way Fit Together. It's written by Mark Russ. William wonders if Mark is being unnecessarily defensive. I contacted Mark Rusk to ask why he wrote the book and what he hopes Quakers in the UK and North America will take away from it. It's sort of like a theological biography. Uh, there's a lot about my journey into Quakers into, and into Christianity in it. It's the product of lots of conversations I've had with Quakers over the last 20 years, both with me discovering Christianity, because I didn't grow up as a Christian or a Quaker, me finding Christianity and then having to explain it to other Quakers, either Quakers who don't really know much about Christianity or Quakers who've had negative experiences of Christianity. Being a Christian within Quakerism in Britain can often feel quite lonely. Either I express myself using the language I want to use, maybe when I'm giving ministry and worship or in talk, talking to Quakers outside of worship, I, I use the language that feels right for me, which is very much rooted in Christianity in the in the Jesus story and Christian theology, and often be met with incomprehension, or even having to sort of justify myself, and and often feeling just incomprehensible, like I'm not understood, or I sort of censor myself and Quakerify my language in terms of taking out lots of the explicit Christian stuff, or using a friend of mine calls it the, the list, sort of God, the light, spirit, or whatever you call it, reading off a list of things to try and include everybody. But then I don't really feel like I'm being true to my experience. Being gay really helps in being a Christian in Quakerism in Britain, because for people who have negative understandings of Christianity, who see Christianity as a sort of religion of empire, a religion that's anti-women or anti-queer, the fact that I'm queer already raises some question marks. It sort of opens a door. So, like, oh, he's gay. Why would he be a Christian? I find it really, really helps. In the book, I talk a lot about my own queerness and being Christian from a queer perspective. That opens up a very exciting doorway into it. For people who are a bit nervous about Christianity, it helps them to feel a bit safer in exploring it. I think the US context is probably very different. And maybe the queer content of the book might be more useful or, or more attractive about the book to readers in the States, but certainly within the Quaker community in Britain, we struggle with talking about these things. That was Mark Russ, author of the book, Quaker Shaped Christianity, How the Jesus Story and the Quaker Way Fit Together. You can read William Shedder's review of the book in the August 2023 issue of Friends Journal. You can also read it at friendsjournal.org. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Quakers Today. Season 2 of Quakers Today is sponsored by American Friends Service Committee. Do you want to challenge unjust systems and promote lasting peace? The American Friends Service Committee, or AFSC, works with communities worldwide to drive social change. Their website features meaningful steps you can take to make a difference. Through their Friends Liaison Program, you can connect your meeting or church with AFSC and their justice campaigns. Find out how you can become part of AFSC's global community of changemakers. Visit afsc.org. That's afsc.org. Visit quakerstoday.org to see our show notes and a full transcript of this episode. And if you stick around after the closing, you will hear listeners' responses to the question, what was a time when you rebelled and why? 
Thank you, friend. I look forward to spending more time with you soon. In a moment, you will hear listeners' voicemails in answer to the question, what was a time when you rebelled and why? But first, let me share with you next month's question. Who is someone who has inspired your faith or worldview? Who is someone who has inspired your faith or your worldview? Leave a voice memo with your name and the town where you live. The number to call is 317-QUAKERS. That's 317-782-5377. 317-QUAKERS. Plus one, if you're calling from outside the USA, you can also send an email. I have these contact details in our show notes over at quakerstoday.org. Now we hear your answers to the question, what was a time when you rebelled and why? Yes, hi, my name is John Krieg. I work with AFSC in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm thinking of a time in 1985 when uh, Brendan and I, and I, just out of college, uh, visited Guatemalan refugees in camps along the Mexico-Guatemalan border. That was... uh, against the law to do that, to visit those camps, and I'm uh, very glad that we uh, disobeyed that law and instead uh, went and visited those folks. It was uh, pivotal uh, in terms of me later then working with Quakers and AFSC for uh, peace and justice in Central America and uh, and around the world. So thank you. Bye-bye. Only three minutes, huh? Okay. My full name is Walter James Bennett Rutledge. In Centennial, Colorado. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be providing the kind of an answer you want because you do seem to be interested in rebelling against society, but I wanted to go on the record as a time when I was rebelling against God. I was in my 30s. I was uh, sifting through Bible, what it actually said versus what various preachers said it said. And uh, I was caught on a verse that said that uh, in the New Jerusalem, everything from before will have been forgotten. I was comparing it with the notion of human beings as the larval stage of what are to become saints. Realized that even among butterflies, the larva does keep its first six legs. But if everything has changed, we have new bodies, we have new natures, we have no memories of everything that's gone before, what does it mean that Jesus saved me? I mean, it's going to be great for this critter that finally emerges, but how? in what sense can that possibly be me? And that uh, got me in a, a lather for several years, and I would only go to church on Palm Sunday, where they went through the part of the gospel where Pontius Pilate goes before the people, and who shall I release in celebration of this Passover season? Jesus Barabbas, or the other Jesus? I uh, got to yell out, at the top of my lungs, give us Barabbas. And to the question, what shall we do with this other Jesus then? I got to yell at the top of my lungs, crucify him. And uh, I skewed that way for several years until I finally circled back to uh, my philosophy slash mathematics training to where I had to confront that I can't even prove I exist now. I have to settle for... Uh, depending on the context, close enough for engineering or a likely story. And, of course, that upset my uh, whole theology. And I think at that point I was working on the 34th Reformed Church of the Creator of Bennett Rutledge. I've settled down to, as far as protesting and acting out against society to uh, considering myself the loyal opposition of a government that is defying 
the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of Colorado, the Home Rule Charter, the City of Centennial. Anyway, I'm keeping busy and trying to uh, keep the City Council on the straight and narrow, and we'll see what happens. God help us all. Amen. Bye.